Hey everyone and welcome to the Retro Channel and to part 3 of the Amstrad CPC 6128 series. So if you haven't seen the other previous two parts, I'll put links to them up there and probably in the video description if I remember. But today we're going to look at installing an external GoTech, all while keeping the original internal disk drive fully functioning. And we're also going to look at drive selection switches. So all of this is still going to be running off a single 5 volt power supply and I've made no cuts or modifications to the case and only a slight modification to the board but still without cutting any traces. So let's jump straight in and check it out. Alright, so to wire up the GoTech externally we need a 34 pin floppy disk drive ribbon cable. Obviously a 34 pin floppy disk drive connector which is going to go on the back of the GoTech. And we need a 34 pin uh, Centronix connector, similar to what you'd see on a five and a quarter inch floppy drive in a, you know, IBM PC compatible. So that goes on the edge connector of the board. Our cable runs in between and goes to the GoTech. The problem is this connector does not supply any power and obviously there's no external power connector here. So here's the plan. All of these pins along the top are all just ground, so they're all sort of matching signal grounds for the actual signals which are on the back. Most of these have a signal wire, but not all of them are used. There are some that are just disconnected. So the actual pin on the edge connector is there, but it doesn't actually go anywhere on the board. So you can see all these little traces that run to various pads on the board but there is one, two, three, four, five that are not connected to anything. The plan is to use these last three to run five volts out. And then on the cable itself, they'll split off and run to the five volt power connector on the GoTech. The GoTech doesn't use that much power, but uh, I think it's about 200 milliamps at five volts. So we do need at least a little bit of power and we don't want to run into the same issue I had with that dodgy DC barrel connector from the power supply. So I'm thinking of using these last three to run five volts and uh, so they'll split off from the cable and run to the power connector on the GoTech. The first thing we need to do is connect those pads to five volts and make sure that we don't use up too much space on the edge connector. So. There's a little bit of room back here, so we just want to make sure we use just the very edge of this edge. What I can do is just scratch out a little bit, just to reveal a little bit more pad to solder to. If we look at that main filter cap that comes in, so there to there, we have a connection. So yes, five volts is sitting on that pad there. So a little bit of flux probably would have helped, but yes, that is a nice solid connection from five volts to those three pins. Should just give all these a quick wipe over while we're in here. Right, so this is the cable. I did just strip a couple of the conductors just to see what kind of resistance they've got. So over a single conductor, there's about two ohms and over three tied together, we get about 0.9 or 0.8. The multimeter itself is 0.2, so at 0.6 ohms over three conductors should be fine. We're not running a huge amount of power for the GoTech anyway. All right, so from pin one on the Amstrad side, uh, this part is pretty easy. We just make sure it's lined up in the connector properly and then just press fit. There it goes. Cool. So that just connects on there. And yes, we didn't run into the actual solder joints that I put on the back, so that is good. And according to CPC Wiki, pin one from the PL9 connector, which is the one on the Amstrad, needs to go to pin 34 on the floppy drive. So pretty much all the pinouts are reversed. So one on this goes to the last one on the floppy drive and the last pin on this goes to the first pin on the floppy drive. 
So if this striped one is pin one here, and that's pin 34 on the end of the GoTek, it's going to need to sit something like that. And because we've now wired pins 33, 31 and 29 to 5 volts, we need to split them off this cable. Right, now because we've got those three wires missing, it means that the cable doesn't easily fit into the connector. So you've got to make sure that the pins are all wired up to the corresponding strands of copper. So this pin one over here looks to be going into the right connector there. And these last three all skip a pin. So you do have to sort of make sure these are lined up, preferably, I think the easiest way is with some tweezers, just to make sure that the little metal bit, which um, basically strips the wire and grabs the copper, is right in the middle of every second pin. Just going to give it a squeeze to get a start on it, and then this tool makes life so much easier. Let's hope I got it right. Oh, it cracked the strain relief. So pin 34 on this side should go to this pin here. The next one should be nothing. Next one should be this pin. Next one should be nothing. Next one should be this pin. And then nothing. And then everything's normal after that. Cool. So now we just may need to turn these into a little five volt connector. So what I've done is just stripped a tiny bit of wire off these three conductors and just put a dab of solder just to force them all into a little blob. And then I'm gonna crimp on this little end connector. It seems solid. So, connector goes that way, it's gonna go in this one. So that should be our GoTek connector with the extra 5 volts. You may be wondering why I didn't hook up any ground here. Um, yeah, or half of these pins all go back to ground on the main board, so that should be enough to keep everything happy. Otherwise, it's back to the drawing board. Let's just do a quick check for shorts. No shorts on the GoTek, and the 5 volts going to the GoTek should be the same as Let's say 5 volts to the disk drive. Cool, and yeah, 0.8 ohms, about what I expected. So before I go hooking everything back up, let's just do a quick test, see if the GoTek actually responds. Yep, GoTek looks happy. Machine hasn't caught on fire. Drawing roughly the expected amount of current, uh, about one amp at five volts. This looks good. Let's connect all this up, see if it actually works. Unfortunately, my power supply that I had planned for this hasn't arrived yet, so still going with the bench power supply. Okay, machine still works. Does the disk drive work? That's good. Right, let's try out the GoTek. So this GoTek case uh, was designed by RetroBard, who is also a patron of the channel, so thank you again. And um, yeah, it houses a GoTek. There's uh, some screw holes in the bottom, so you can just put a couple little screws to hold the GoTek in place. And there's little spots for where you can place rubber feet. I think they're probably one mil. I mean, one centimeter, maybe they're eight millimeter, something like that. I just so happened to have the right ones on hand, so that was kind of convenient. And yeah, that just sits on top of the CPC.
GoTech is saying something. Now, to switch to drive B, uh, I think we do a pipe and then B. And it says disk missing. Well, there is a disk there, so what's up with that? Ah, I think I need to swap drive like S0 and S1 on the GoTech because it was set to S1 when I had it internal or S0 when it was internal. So I think drive select one. Let's see. Right. Let's just do cat. Let's make sure we haven't messed up. Okay, drive A still seems to be working. Let's go to drive B. Disk is missing. Oh, hang on. Oh, disk is working. Maybe I just didn't have it plugged in firmly enough. Uh, one. Go take is doing its thing. I think. I haven't changed disk images yet, so. Ah. So I did briefly read about this issue. So it's saying drive A disk is missing. A lot of games are coded to load everything off drive A. So when you stick an external drive onto drive B, it breaks compatibility with certain software. Let's try something else. Oop. Just one. Cool. Joystick is working properly. There's a weird kind of shadow as I pass the ladders. Almost like a blue shadow, but it only happens when you pass the ladders. I don't know if that's part of the game or is that a weird video issue. So it looks like I will need to consider how to swap drive A to drive B and vice versa. I have read that there is a little switch that you can put in um, that switches the signals between the drives. So Amstrad thinks it's accessing drive A when it's actually accessing drive B or the external drive and vice versa. But they do seem to involve cutting traces and if if you've gathered anything from this video, I'm really trying to undo this without doing any permanent changes to the machine. So cutting traces isn't something that I want to do. At the same time, I don't have any other ideas. All right, so after a bit of thought and a whole lot of Googling, I finally settled on a solution for this drive switcher. I'm going to use a mod that was documented by Gerald on the CBC Wiki forums. It pretty much involves installing a switch, so I've actually repurposed the one that I was using for the SCART uh, 5 volt connector. We'll get back to what I did instead of that in a minute. But um, yes, I'm going to reuse this switch in the same spot that I had it before because that's really the only place I can put it without drilling a hole in the case. But I'm not going to use the original ABBA switch because that does involve cutting traces and also cutting a wire on this floppy ribbon cable here. 
The solution by Gerald is a little bit cleaner. It still may involve cutting a trace, but I'm going to do my best to avoid that as I really don't want to cut any traces and obviously I don't want to cut up the case either. So I've done my best to do that so far. Hopefully I can continue with the uh, no cut mods. So what we need to do is first get to the underside of the board. And what we first need to do is isolate pin 29 on the floppy drive controller. This is the drive select signal. So normally this is where you'd be cutting a trace just next to it, but I'm gonna try and do this without cutting that trace. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of fresh solder to this. And then we're gonna come in with the desoldering gun and try and suck, <laughs> suck every last bit of solder out of there. And that pin does appear to be free, so if I can do this correctly, it won't make a connection to the through hole surrounding it. So what I was thinking is to get a tiny bit of heat shrink over the pin and through that through hole, but even my smallest bit of heat shrink tubing won't shrink down that much, so that's not going to work. Let's go for plan B. So my other idea was to attempt to lift this pin out of the through hole uh, without snapping it off. And with some gentle prying, I did manage to get it up and out of the through hole without breaking it. All right, so we now have one isolated leg. We can solder to the end of that. So we need to make a connection from this leg to pin five of IC209, which is this pin here. So I'm going to route the wire from that pin under the actual IC itself, like so. And then it's just going to come up and go to that spot there. So pin 29 of the floppy disk controller is now isolated from the board. It simply goes from here to pin 5 of this logic IC, which is a spare exclusive OR gate. Next thing we need is a 2.2K resistor and a 10K resistor. The 2.2K is going to connect from pin 6 of the 74LS139 to 5 volts, and the 10K is going to connect from pin 4 to 5 volts. Now this chunky trace along here is supplying 5 volts, and this chunky trace down here is also supplying 5 volts, so either either. I think I'm going to keep everything nice and short and go for this 5 volts just here. All right, that's the 2.2K in place. I reckon we just put the 10K like that. All right, now we need to connect a wire from where pin 29 used to go to, which is pins 9 and 10 of IC206. This is a 74LS38. So you can see those two are joined together. Uh, by this little trace in between, so either of those pins will be fine to solder to. And that needs to go to pin 6 of our 74LS136, just here. Alright, that is all looking pretty neat. The last thing we need to do here is connect a wire from pin 4 of the 74LS136 to one side of our switch. Unfortunately, this wire is not quite thin enough to fit back through one of the vias, so I might just route it around the side of the board. In fact, what I might do is just clear out one of these holes. So I should be able to route the wire through here, which is an unused vias for like a... an inductor by the looks of it. Don't know why it's not installed, but uh, that provides a nice little place for the wire to come back through and it's going to be right around where our switch is going to sit. So that's the underside of the board done. All right, and now for the switch. So all we need to do is connect this wire to one of the outer legs and the common wire is just going to go to ground. So that's easy enough to find close by. All right, let's just double check our connections. So we should have a connection from here to pin four of this guy, which we do. And this pin here should connect to our lifted pin over here, which it does. And there shouldn't be any connection between this and pins eight and nine over here, which there still is. How does that work? One, two, three, four, five. Ah, okay. I was supposed to run that green wire to this pin here, pin six, not pin five. 
What I've done here is pretty much reconnect the whole circuit as it was to begin with. All right, let's flip this back over. And we shouldn't have a connection from this guy up here to either of these pins over here, which we don't. That looks better. All right, the center pin of our switch is connected to ground. We should be ready to give this whole thing a test. All right, so I think we're ready to test this out. I've got the old LCD display here. Oh, and uh, this is what I did with the SCART cable. So I bought a female to two male splitters, cut one of the ends off and basically ran that back through the uh, orange wire, which goes to the fast blanking and function switching pins in the SCART connector. So this should now work the same way as it did when I had the switch there. So let's plug all this in. So those two plug in the back there. May as well hook up audio while we're at it. And we're just gonna use the bench supply to power the rest. 5.2 volts, that should be fine. I won't hook up the external GoTech just yet. We'll just see if this powers on first. And yes, it's already in RGB mode because I've got that five volts connected. So it's telling the monitor to switch to RGB. All right, cool. It still works. Uh, let's power that off. Connect this up. GoTech is powered on. My display's fallen out a little bit. It's all crooked and shit. That's okay. Uh, all right, let's just do a cat. So it's saying drive a disk missing. So let's just throw this in. Retry. All right, so at the moment, drive A is drive A. Drive B should be drive B. Yes. Let's flip the switch. Do another cat. This should give us the directory from the disk, which it does. And if we swap back to drive A, that gives us the directory of the GoTech. So as far as the Amstrad's concerned, it still thinks it's accessing drive A when we're actually sending stuff to drive B and vice versa. So now if we try and run view to kill, it should load up just fine, which is where we got to before. But when it starts to load the rest of the program, that's when it should either fail or just work. Hopefully it'll just work. It should just work. All right, let's see. I can hear the GoTech clicking away. Looks to be working. Cool. We're good. Let me shut that off. So, um, yeah, the drive switcher seems to be working just fine. That means that I should be able to now load pretty much anything off the external GoTech. And it also should allow me to create floppy disks. I have no idea how to do that, but in theory, I should be able to copy stuff from the GoTech to an actual floppy disk. The current drawer sitting idle is about 1.6 amps with the GoTech and everything else connected. Uh, I did still try it with the original monitor uh, before I did the drive switch. It still manages to power the machine and the internal drive just running off five volts. Uh, but once I hooked up the GoTech and tried to access the disk drives, it wouldn't work. It would just reset like it did uh, when I had that dodgy cable in the very first part of this series. So I wouldn't recommend trying to run this machine just off five volts with the original monitors, but maybe I'll uh, pull that apart one day because it is a little bit filthy and uh, I'll clean it out and see if maybe I can bump up the current supply on the five volt rail in that thing, but who knows. Either way, I think I'm gonna be mostly using this in RGB mode anyway. So the original monitor is, as I said at the start, it's nice to have, but am I really gonna use it? So I'm looking forward to checking out some of the games that the Amstrad has to offer. I have no idea what games are available or what's popular. Uh, so if you know more, leave a comment down below. I'd be interested to know like what your favorite games are or even favorite demos. Uh, it'd be nice to see what this thing can actually do and find some hidden gems on it. 
So I want to give a massive thanks to Mr. Lurch for donating this machine and the matching monitor. A shout out to Randall for the uh, floppy drive adapter. Uh, thanks to Retrobard for the external GoTech case. Thanks to the people on CBC Wiki for all their knowledge and information. And a huge thanks to the people that support the channel on Patreon. Uh, if you want to do the same, links to that are down below. Uh, but until next time, thank you all for watching. Bye. It's a manual. Oh, hang on. It's a two speed manual? Your time's up. Brutal.